that is that the tapes will not bother you except in the sense Tapes will not bother you, except in the sense that each tape takes 45 minutes, and then there will be about a two-minute stop for blackboard erasing and smoking in the middle. There will be no questions at the end of the lecture. Professor Wood. Professor Ginsburg, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very great pleasure for me to have this opportunity this afternoon to speak to you uh, under these uh, somewhat novel circumstances, which have in fact dictated the choice of my particular topic this afternoon. I shall describe our work on Cephalosporin C. Uh, this is a lecture which is said by some to be not without a certain historic interest. And since the Technion, uh, led on by Dr. Pachornik, uh, has revealed itself as the only place in the world with the technical capacity to record this lecture, uh, I was urged to, to choose this particular topic. That means that some of what I will discuss this afternoon will perhaps have been read about uh, by some of you, but perhaps I shall present uh, the material orally in a somewhat different way uh, from that which you've read. I don't know. I never know what uh, I'm going to say in these lectures until it comes out. And furthermore, there are some new things uh, which have developed since our work in this area was published. I'll just make uh, one further introductory comment. Professor Ginsburg said there will be no questions at the end of the lecture. I hope that that's correct. That is, that there'll be no questions in your mind. <laughs> I presume he meant no questions will be asked. I'm afraid that I can't promise you that there won't be some questions in your mind, but I hope that there won't be too many. Now, cephalosporin C is a natural substance. It is produced in the course of the metabolism of a microorganism, Cephalosporium acrimonium, a microorganism which was discovered in the sewage of a small Italian town by the mayor of that town who happened to be an amateur microbiologist. His discovery was brought to the attention of Abraham and his colleagues at Oxford. And after a very painstaking investigation, Abraham isolated the substance cephalosporin C in the early 1950s. The work was published, I believe, in 1955. Now, cephalosporin C was not without practical interest because it was found to exert a moderate uh, action against various pathological organisms somewhat similar in quality to that exerted by the penicillins. But the special feature of interest about the biological activity of cephalosporin C was this, 
that while quantitatively its activity was not high, that activity was not destroyed by penicillinase, and consequently, the activity was found to be maintained against microorganisms which had become penicillin resistant. So this led to a special practical aspect uh, of interest in cephalosporin C. Now I should like first to draw for you the structure of cephalosporin C which was established about half a dozen years after it had first been isolated, established by Abraham and his colleagues again, on the one hand by chemical methods, and on the other by Dorothy Hodgkin by X-ray crystallographic methods. Their work was published simultaneously, and they agreed upon the following structure for cephalosporin C. Now, if you examine the structure, you will see at once that it has some unusual features and that it is reminiscent in structure of the penicillins. I mentioned already that the biological activity of cephalosporin C was similar to that of the penicillins, and so is the structure. Now let me, in order to illustrate that, draw below this the structure of one of the better known penicillins. At the bottom, then, one has penicillin G, and at the top, cephalosporin C. 
And now let us note first the similarities. Each of them contains this very remarkable and special four-membered beta-lactam ring. In each of these molecules, that structural feature represents a point of very special instability and reactivity. That is to say, the four-membered beta-lactam ring in penicillin G and that encephalosporin C. undergoes very ready hydrolytic cleavage at this amid bond. Indeed, this very reactive structural feature is known now to be closely associated with the biological activity of both substances. That special feature also represents has represented a particular challenge from the synthetic point of view. That is to say, it has turned out, first in the case of the penicillins, especially in the case of the penicillins, to be a structural feature very hard to construct artificially. Now, several times already I have used the term the penicillins and I've put a structure there with a particular uh, suffix, penicillin G. And let me explain the use of these terms. The fact is that there are many penicillins. There are many naturally occurring penicillins which differ from one another in the following rather simple way. Here we have in penicillin G a phenyl acetyl group attached to a nitrogen atom in an amid linkage. Now, the other natural penicillins differ from penicillin G in that other, other groupings replace the phenyl acetyl group of penicillin G in attachment to that particular nitrogen atom, which is itself attached to the four-membered ring. Thus, if there is a pentenyl group here, we have penicillin F as another naturally occurring substance. Furthermore, chemists have found ways of removing artificially the phenylacetyl group of penicillin G and attaching to the thus freed amino nitrogen atom other acyl groups. And this has led to the creation by partial synthesis of hundreds of artificial penicillins, many of which have uh, received uh, a place of considerable utility in practical medicine. That is to say then, starting with penicillin G, which is available in nature, this grouping can be removed and other acyl groups can be put. Uh, in place of the phenylacetyl group to lead to new substances, some of which are superior to penicillin G, for example, in their therapeutic utility. Now, precisely the same circumstances obtain for cephalosporin C. You remember I mentioned that cephalosporin C has, in a quantitative sense, relatively low order of antibiotic activity but it has been possible to find ways to remove the acyl group, which in cephalosporin C is derived from D-alpha amino adipic acid. There is a D-alpha amino adipoyl group attached to the nitrogen, which is itself attached to the four-membered beta-lactam ring. That alpha amino adipoyl residue can be removed 
and replaced by other acial groupings. And in that way, new cephalosporins have been obtained, which have retained the capacity of not being inactivated by penicillinase and thus being active against penicillin-resistant organisms, while at the same time having a very highly heightened level, absolute level, of antibiotic activity. And so some modified cephalosporins have already made their way into medicine uh, and are useful in the treatment of disease. I should say parenthetically that the organic chemist has exercised a very considerable degree of ingenuity, almost as much as I'm exercising to do this, in order to remove these groupings. You see, these are, these are honest amid groupings and not very easily susceptible of hydrolysis. And in the same molecule, there is the beta-lactam amid grouping, which I've already pointed out, is extremely susceptible to cleavage reactions. And so very special ways have had to be devised for removing, breaking these amid groups without damaging the four-membered lactam amid group. Well, I'm not going into the, the methods uh, for effecting uh, this very subtle change uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> now, let us put one of the modified cephalosporins on the board. And for that, I'll be quiet and try to remove this device so I can get over there and put it on. Here is a modified cephalosporin, cephalotene, and you will see that it is just like cephalosporin except that the alpha amino adipoyl group has been replaced by an alpha thiophene acetic acid group. And cephalotene is in fact one of the modified cephalosporins which is of quite some practical utility. Now, let us examine further for a bit the similarities and differences between the penicillins as represented by penicillin G and the cephalosporins. We see the common lactam ring and attached to it the common alpha nitrogen atom and beta sulfur atom. These things are all similar in the two classes. The cephalosporins, however, have a six-membered ring fused here on the right, whereas the penicillins have a five-membered saturated ring as contrasted 
with that six-membered unsaturated ring. Now, one other point might be made before we get down to the matter of considering the synthesis of structures of this kind. That is the matter of stereochemistry. The stereochemical situation presented by these molecules is not all that complicated a one. You will notice that in the penicillins, there are three asymmetric centers here, here, and here. Now, in the nuclear part of the cephalosporins, there are only two asymmetric centers. And these two are oriented both in a relative and in an absolute sense in a manner precisely analogous to those in the penicillins. That is, the hydrogen atoms attached to the four-membered lactam ring are on the same side of that lactam ring. They are cis, and in an absolute sense, they are above the plane of the blackboard as written. In the cephalosporins, the third asymmetric center present in the five-membered ring of the penicillins is, of course, absent in view of the presence at the corresponding center of a double bond. So the stereochemical problem did not seem very considerable, but that was no reason we felt in planning our synthetic work to slight it. And there, a certain amount of history is perhaps in order. In considering the synthesis of any complicated or moderately complicated natural structure, it is always worthwhile to pay attention, let's say, in one's planning to the work that has gone before. And of course, the history of synthetic work in the field of the penicillins is a fairly extensive and interesting one. As I'm sure many of you know, the penicillins were first noted uh, as a result of their activity by Fleming in 1928, and Fleming's early observations were followed up in 1939-40 by uh, Florey, uh, Chain, and others at Oxford. And the recognition that there was a very powerful antibiotic substance produced by various penicillia and the untoward circumstances of the time led to the setting up of a very massive British American program for the isolation of this powerful antibiotic substance, turned out to be penicillin, for the determination of its structure and, if possible, for its synthesis. Well, the isolation went along very rapidly indeed, and methods were developed very quickly for the production by natural means of the penicillins in very large quantity in time to be useful during the war. The structural work proceeded a little more slowly, but it was completed uh, by the time the uh, program was disbanded. But in spite, perhaps, of the efforts of more chemists than had ever worked on any single synthetic problem, the problem of synthesizing penicillins had not been concluded in 1945 at the time the program was abandoned. In short, this relatively simple molecular array posed some very special synthetic difficulties, largely associated with the very high reactivity of this unusual four-membered lactam system. Now, many chemists continued to be fascinated by the problem of synthesizing penicillins, 
after the British American official program had been abandoned. But it was not until the late 1950s that Professor Sheehan at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, after some dozen years of intensive effort, did succeed in developing a synthesis of the penicillins. Naturally, in considering whether the structurally related cephalosporins might be available by synthesis, it was desirable to consider whether what had been learned by Professor Sheehan and others in their work on penicillin synthesis might be applied to this new but related field. And we decided at the outset that that was not the case. And uh, I will illustrate, I hope, a main reason for that in the following way. I've indicated that the beta-lactam ring of the penicillins is very easily cleaved. The product of that cleavage is, as one would expect, an amino acid. One generates an NH group and a carboxyl group. These substances are known as the penicilloic acids. They are the products of the hydrolytic cleavage of the penicillins. Now, the penicilloic acids are not very difficult substances to synthesize, particularly if one doesn't uh, uh, pay particular heed to the stereochemical factors. And indeed, very early in the work on penicillin synthesis, the penicilloic acids were synthesized. And the whole difficulty in affecting the synthesis of the penicillins was the deceptively simple problem of removing the elements of a molecule of water to produce this highly unstable and reactive beta-lactam system. And it was this problem which Professor Sheehan managed ultimately to solve in the case of certain penicillins. Now, in the case of the cephalosporins, I have already mentioned that a similar lability is observed for this four-membered ring, that is, cleavage of the four-membered ring can be brought about very readily. And one might imagine that there would result from such cleavage an amino acid entirely analogous to the penicilloic acid which results from the cleavage of the four-membered ring of penicillin. That, however, is not the case. In the case of the cephalosporins, the cleavage of the four-membered ring must indeed lead to a proximate product, which is the amino acid of which I have just spoken. But that substance in that case is so delicately constituted that it does not survive the conditions of its creation. Consequently, the hydrolytic cleavage of the cephalosporins leads to a very deep-seated and complete degradation of the molecule into very small pieces. That is to say, that the analogs of the penicilloic acids, the analogs in the cephalosporin series, are clearly compounds of a highly delicate and fugitive constitution. And it seemed unwise to choose such substances as the basis of a plan for the synthesis of the cephalosporins. Secondly, I mentioned already that in the previous work on penicillin synthesis, no heed had been paid to the stereochemical aspects of the problem. And we felt that even though the stereochemical problem was not an especially serious or difficult one, that it was time that it would be given logical and careful consideration. <coughs> 
And finally, of course, it's always fun to try to solve a problem in a new and original way. Now, quite often in the course of a synthetic program, the entire tone and direction of the program may be set by a relatively small number of key ideas or principles. And in this particular case of our work on cephalosporin synthesis, I think two such key ideas stand out. The first of them was this. To concentrate upon the construction of the most unusual feature of the structure. In other words, to try to build this beta-lactam grouping, which is the nub of the molecules of both classes, the penicillins and the cephalosporins. We had in mind, even from the beginning of our work, that could we effect that particular task, that we might then be in a position to make substances other than the penicillins or the cephalosporins, which would contain this key central nuclear part, this specially reactive beta-lactam structure, but which could be modified not only as had already been the case by artificial substitutions in this left-hand area of the molecule, but which might be modified by purely synthetic means over on the right-hand side, where the only modifications available so far were the two represented by the natural penicillins on the one hand and the natural cephalosporins on the other. The second of the key principles upon which our work was based was the following. We decided to use as our starting material, a readily available optically active substance, namely the common natural amino acid L-cysteine, which has this structure. Now let me try to explain in detail why we considered that this might be a useful starting material for synthesis of substances of the cephalosporin or penicillin classes. What is present in the cysteine molecule? First, a two-carbon backbone to which is attached a carboxyl group, an alpha nitrogen atom, and a beta sulfur atom. Now, may I direct your attention again to cephalosporin C, which contains in this important nuclear portion of its molecule, a two-carbon backbone, 
containing a modified carboxyl group, an alpha nitrogen atom, and a beta sulfur atom. So all of the key elements of this part of the cephalosporin structure, save one, is built in to the cysteine molecule. The alpha nitrogen, the beta sulfur, the two carbon backbone, the carboxyl group in modified form. And of this key portion of the cephalosporin molecule, there is lacking in the cysteine molecule only this nitrogen atom. Furthermore, cysteine, as it occurs in nature and as it is readily available, is optically active. It contains an asymmetric center at the alpha of this carbon atom, of this two carbon backbone. And that asymmetric center has attached to it hydrogen, nitrogen, S carbon, and carboxyl. And the nature and the orientation in an absolute stereochemical sense of those groups in cysteine is precisely identical with the nature of the corresponding groups in cephalosporin C. Hydrogen, nitrogen, S to carbon, to this asymmetric carbon, and carboxyl. So in using the cheap, readily available cysteine as our starting material, we had in effect, the moment we bought a bottle of cysteine, solved half of our stereochemical problem. Now, that advantage, however, and the purely gross structural advantages that we felt were available through the use of cysteine as our starting material, were bought at a price. Cysteine is, in fact, a kind of concatenation of highly reactive groupings, a highly reactive amino group highly reactive sulfhydryl group, highly reactive carboxyl group, and for that matter, a moderately reactive alpha methine group activated by the attached carboxyl group. Indeed, in this entire molecular assemblage, there is only one point which could be regarded as unreactive, the one that I've left out of the circles here, namely this methylene group. But it is precisely at that methylene group, the only unreactive part of the cysteine molecule, where we must introduce an atom, namely this nitrogen atom, which is the one part of our nuclear structure which is absent in our essentially prefabricated building material. the only unreactive point of the cysteine molecule was the point at which we must bring about a chemical reaction, one which would serve for the introduction of the missing nitrogen atom, and one which preferentially should be brought about in a stereospecific manner. Namely, we must introduce a nitrogen at this point. In doing so, that will become an asymmetric center and we will wish to put the nitrogen at that point in one of the two a priori possible ways. And it would be hoped not indiscriminately, but stereospecifically. Now, the organic chemist faced with this kind of problem uh, proceeds in a sense in a routine fashion. That is, 
if there are present reactive groupings which are likely to interfere with uh, an operation to be carried out elsewhere within the molecule, these groupings are rendered less reactive or obtrusive through the introduction of protective groupings. And that was, of course, the procedure which we followed here at the outset of our work in a very simple way. By reaction of cysteine with acetone, a bridge was made across the amino and the sulfhydryl groups, that is, this thiazolidine was produced, and this, of course, blocked two of the active hydrogen atoms of the cysteine, the original cysteine molecule, this one of the sulfhydryl group, and one of the active hydrogens attached to nitrogen. Now, the remaining active hydrogen attached to nitrogen was blocked in another way. Thiazolidine, this carboxylic acid, was treated with phosgene and tetrabutanol and pyridine at minus 75 degrees. Now, what happens is this. The tetrabutanol and the phosgene react to give tetrabutyl oxycarbonyl chloride, which acylates the free NH group to give the protected tertiary butyl oxycarbonyl residue. That operation completes the protection of the originally reactive NH2 group. And for later reference, I'll mention that, of course, the tertiary butyl oxycarbonyl group was put here because it was one which we hoped might be removed at a later stage when it would no longer be needed by rather gentle treatment with acid. Now, there is a special feature of this reaction which deserves perhaps a certain comment. Namely, this nitrogen atom is relatively weakly basic. It is alpha-2, a carboxyl group. It is alpha-2, the electron-withdrawing sulfur atom. And it's highly hindered. And consequently, it is not a nitrogen atom which is easily susceptible of acylation. And indeed, the success of this particular acylation depends on its intramolecular character. That is, it is quite clear from our experiments that the reaction of the tertiary butyl oxycarbonyl chloride is first not with the nitrogen atom, but rather with the carboxyl group to give a mixed anhydride of this sort. The carboxyl group, in short, is rather accessible. And in the presence of the pyridine, also there in the reaction mixture, it is ionized and is therefore relatively basic. And so the tertiary butyl oxycarbonyl chloride does react first with that carboxylate ion to give this mixed anhydride. And then the tertiary butyl oxycarbonyl group is delivered internally to the nitrogen atom. And this is then a small but perhaps interesting example of the very useful principle in organic chemistry of bringing about relatively ready intramolecular reactions in cases where the corresponding bimolecular reaction is inefficient or impossible. 
At this point then, with the tertiary butyl oxycarbonyl thiazolidine, we had completed the protection both of the sulfur and the nitrogen, and there only remained the carboxyl group, which was very easily protected by esterification, uh, either with diazomethane or in a more practical way with the dimethyl acetal of dimethyl formamide, which is a rather novel but very good methylating agent. So that replaced then the hydrogen of the carboxyl by a methyl group. And now our cysteine molecule, originally a boiling cauldron of react reactive groupings, was now uh, at least uh, converted into something in which the relative reactivity, relative to the originally very reactive other groupings present, had been augmented. We stood now, we felt, a better chance of bringing about reaction at this necessary site, at this methylene alpha to sulfur. Now, in fact, a great many ways uh, were tried to effect some kind of substitution at that still rather recalcitrant position. And I shall not here uh, describe all of the ways in which we were not able to introduce substituents. But we'll describe one first, which uh, was very successful. That is to say, when this protected thiazolidine derivative was heated at 110 degrees with azo-dicarboxylic acid dimethyl ester, what appears on the surface at least to be a very simple direct substitution reaction was observed the result of the reaction was the introduction in this desired position of a hydrazo ester grouping. This then was the structure of the product formed. And you see here is the azo ester, which reacted with the thiazolidine, attached to the methylene group. And it looks as though there's been a simple addition reaction of a CH bond to the azoester grouping. Now, actually, we have excellent reason to suppose that the reaction is rather more interesting and complicated than, than it appears from this simple presentation of the overall result. We are quite certain that the reaction is initiated by the attack of the sulfur atom upon a nitrogen atom of the azo ester, and that there is produced then an intermediate, which we might write in this way. sulfur attacking the nitrogen atom of the azoester grouping, giving a new bond between sulfur and nitrogen. Now that converts the sulfur into a site next to which activation of the CH bond may be expected. And indeed, there is excellent evidence from some of our experiments that the migration of hydrogen from that alpha position to nitrogen is probably concerted with the formation of the 
sulfur-nitrogen bond. And if we draw out the species resulting from those suggested electronic changes, It is this. And you notice that the carbon atom adjacent now to the positively charged sulfur bears a negative charge. And of course, many of you, I'm sure, recognize that sulfonium sulfur can stabilize an adjacent negative charge. In other words, this is not an unusual situation with the sulfonium sulfur stabilizing the adjacent carbanion center, undoubtedly in a situation of this sort, there is actual multiple bonding of a sort, d orbital bonding between the carbon and sulfur, so that this bond between carbon and sulfur in these circumstances is of an order higher than a single bond. And now to complete the change, one need only essentially move the nitrogen now to the alpha position in a manner which may be symbolized by these arrows. That will give us then the substitution product which I have drawn there. Now the evidence for this kind of thing, that is for this course of the reaction, I think I might mention very briefly as follows. The actual substitution reaction which I've described was carried out upon the ester of the thiazolidine shown there on the right. If the same reaction be carried out on the corresponding acid, substance in which there is a, an active hydrogen here, very active hydrogen, then the reaction takes quite a different course. <laughs> which may be outlined in the following way. We suppose that, as indicated in the earlier case, the sulfur atom attacks a nitrogen atom of the azo ester, but the negative center thus created at the other nitrogen atom now takes up the active hydrogen of the carboxyl group. <laughs> that would give us an intermediate of this structure. And notice that now, of course, there is not any driving force for the removal of a hydrogen alpha to the sulfur. The demand for a proton by this negatively charged nitrogen atom in the initial intermediate has been satisfied by the very ready transfer of the acidic proton. And it would not be surprising if a subsequent change of this kind might occur, namely, the sulfonium sulfur now simply is loosened from its attach attachment to tertiary carbon and the anion, carboxylate anion, takes its place. And the result of that change would be this structure, 
that is a lactone actually containing a sulfur nitrogen bond. And this is in fact the product which is isolated when the acid is used in the azoester condensation rather than the ester. And this constitutes, we think, quite good evidence that this apparent direct substitution reaction is indeed rather more interesting and does involve this interesting direct attack of sulfur on nitrogen. Now I mentioned also that we think that the reaction is intramolecular insofar as the movement of hydrogen is concerted with the formation of the sulfur nitrogen bond. I shall not detail here the evidence for that uh, hypothesis, uh, but only mention that it depends essentially upon our inability to construct an intramolecular version of this reaction. You see, this is a bimolecular condensation of this methylene group with the azoester grouping. We tried, of course, to effect such a substitution by having the azoester group attached to this carboxyl site. It does not take place. And if one tries to construct a transition state for the substitution, the intramolecular substitution, in which the sulfur nitrogen bond is being formed as the hydrogen moves in such an intramolecular case, that transition state is sterically impossible. That is, uh, roughly speaking, then the basis for our believing that the reaction is probably fully concerted. All right, now, this substitution reaction does take place in essentially quantitative yield, provided that the precise conditions uh, necessary uh, are observed rigorously. And it takes place stereospecifically. That is, a new asymmetric center is, of course, created when the substitution occurs. A new asymmetric center is created here. It is created stereospecifically. It does put a nitrogen atom at the point needed, but if you refer to our cephalosporin structure, you'll see that the nitrogen is on the opposite side of the molecule from that desired. The nitrogen is in front of the blackboard toward you, whereas the similarly placed nitrogen atom in the cephalosporin structure is in back of the blackboard. The hydrogen, you see, is in the front, if you look over there on the right. Well, so we had a, st a stereospecific reaction, but in the wrong stereochemical sense. Well, that didn't worry us too much, since we felt that this azoester grouping, hydrazoester grouping, which had been introduced, should be quite a reactive one, and that we should be able to effect transformations, substitutions, using it as a key, and that we could, in short, reverse the stereochemistry uh, of the uh, this newly created center. Well, now, all hydrazine derivatives are more or less susceptible to oxidation. And so, uh, not surprisingly, uh, our attempts to effect a modification, a new substitution at this center, uh, starting with the hydrazoester, involved oxidations. And in fact, we found that when the hydrazoester was treated with lead tetracetate in benzene and the crude reaction mixture was then treated with methanol and sodium acetate, that a new product was produced of the following structure. That is to say, by this two-step sequence, oxidation with lead tetraacetate in benzene followed by treatment with methanol and sodium acetate, the entire hydrazoester grouping was replaced 
by the simpler acetoxy grouping. Now this reaction too, which appears to be a direct substitution, is in fact also more complicated and interesting than it might seem at first sight. One would expect that such a hydrazine would be transformed first into an azo derivative by loss of two electrons under the influence of the strong oxidant lead tetraacetate. And the, the kind of azo grouping which would result by such a loss of two electrons uh, would be uh, something of this kind. And you will notice that the carboxyl, carbomethoxyl group on the left is one which would be very readily displaced, of course, attached as it is to a positive quaternary nitrogen atom by any nucleophile. And that displacement would lead to an azoester of this structure with an alpha hydrogen atom. Now this is a kind of system which is known to be susceptible to attack by lead tetraacetate with replacement of the hydrogen by acetoxy. And in fact, we know that in the case of various hydrazoesters comparable in structure to this one, which is one of our intermediates, this is precisely the course which this reaction follows. And in some cases in which we have groups other than the simple methyl ester group present in this intermediate, we have isolated and characterized fully in the crystalline form the intermediates of this type, the acetoxy azoesters of this type. Contemplate for a moment what remarkable substances th those are. They have attached to a single carbon atom, a sulfur atom, an acetoxy group, and an azoester group. Very unusual substances indeed. And yet, as I say, in several instances where this group varies somewhat, we have isolated such compounds in the crystalline state, and they're relatively uh, stable substances. Now, what happens then is that the lead tetraacetate carries the reaction this far, and then the sodium acetate methanol effects the following further changes. The nucleophile acetate ion displaces the carbomethoxyl group of the azoester grouping, and in turn, nitrogen is produced. That generates an anion at this carbon atom, alpha to sulfur, and it ultimately takes up from the medium a proton, and that gives the acetoxy compound. <coughs> now, This reaction I've written as giving mainly, or I've written it as giving the trans acetoxy compound, namely, as I've written it, the stereochemistry of the replacement puts the acetoxy group in the same place as the hydrazoester grouping. There's no inversion. Now that is not quite literally true. In fact, there is produced some of the isomeric cis-acetoxy ester. 
Now notice that the asymmetry in this series of operations is created at the last of these series of steps that I've outlined, namely when this carbon takes up a proton. It's fairly clear that the trans acetoxy compound, which is in fact the major product, would be expected to be the major product. The course, the stereochemical course of the reaction is in fact dictated by the presence here in the adjacent position of the carbomethoxyl grouping, which is quite a bulky grouping, and will of course force another group uh, largely into the more remote trans position. But there is a certain amount of cis compound produced. Nevertheless, in the next stage, this slight defect in stereospecificity is rectified. When the crude reaction mixture, which is largely trans-acetoxy compound, containing some cis-acetoxy compound, is hydrolyzed by more continued, longer continued, methanolysis, or, as we ultimately found, by carefully controlled hydrolysis using uh, just an equivalent of sodium hydroxide, a hydroxy compound is produced, It appears to be the simple hydrolysis product of the acetoxy compound. And it is a fact that only one hydroxy ester is produced. Now, in the early stages of our work, we knew that only the transhydroxy ester was produced. We suspected strongly that cis acetoxy ester was present before the hydrolysis. How then could it be that only the trans hydroxy compound was produced? Well, this is as good a point as any, I think, to emphasize what a remarkable substance this hydroxy compound is. You notice that it contains attached to the same carbon atom, an hydroxyl group and a sulfur atom. Now, one of the things one learns earliest in basic courses in organic chemistry is that carbon bearing two electronegative or electron attracting groupings represents an unstable situation. And one might well expect that a compound of this structure could be incapable of more than transitory existence. Note the following possibility. A priori, this compound could be a participant in a ring chain tautomeric transformation. Which would set the hydroxy ester in equilibrium with this sulfhydryl aldehyde ester. Now, in the intermolecular case, this would correspond, let us say, to the loss of water from the hydrate of a carbonyl compound. Now, the resulting 
substance, this aldehyde, this mercaptoaldehyde. Also looks like a fairly reactive substance, which might do quite a number of things. Notice that it is a beta aldehydoester. It could therefore, in principle at least, undergo enolization to give a relatively stable enol of this structure. As you know, beta dicarbonyl compounds do enolize in this way quite readily in many cases, and the enol is stabilized not only by the conjugative interaction, but by the strong hydrogen bonding, which is possible in these circumstances. Furthermore, you'll notice that the sulfhydryl group is incorporated again in a system in which we have carbon with two electronegative groupings, and so this entire group might be cleaved. With the loss of the elements of thioacetone. Well, these then represented some by no means implausible ways in which our intermediate hydroxy compound might well have destroyed itself, with most unfortunate effects for the further onward progress of our synthesis. Because, you see, immediately this first stage takes place. We've lost the asymmetry at this carbon atom. At the second stage, the asymmetry at both of these centers has disappeared. And indeed, this would represent uh, a disaster of the most uh, final and serious sort had this kind of thing happened. So we were playing a dangerous and exciting game in attempting to manipulate these substituents alpha to the sulfur atom because of these inherent possibilities for the auto-annihilation of any one of our intermediates. There's even another possibility that I should mention, namely the simple beta elimination of water from such an intermediate, or the beta elimination of acetic acid from this intermediate. Or, for that matter, the beta elimination of hydrazine dicarboxylic acid from this intermediate. Any of those changes could have led to the thiazoline of this structure. And this, again, would have been the end of our work in this area, at least along these lines. Now, the fact that I'm here talking about the work indicates, of course, that not all of these things did take place. But some of them did. In fact, the circumstance that only the trans hydroxy acid is obtained from the mixture of trans acetoxy and cis acetoxy esters is a consequence of the operation of this part of these changes that I've mentioned. You see, the ring chain tautomerism, as I've already mentioned, disabuses this carbon of its asymmetry. And when the SH adds back, it has a choice. It can give either the trans or the cis hydroxy compound. And at equilibrium, clearly, the trans is very strongly favored. And so the trans ester, trans acetoxy ester, can give directly the trans hydroxy ester. But the cis acetoxy ester will be hydrolyzed to a cis hydroxy ester, which, again, can open in this ring chain tautomerism.
to the mercaptoaldehyde and then close with the regeneration of asymmetry in the new trans sense. And in fact, subsequently, we showed by the isolation of the two pure compounds that each of them does, in fact, give as the sole product in almost quantitative yield either the trans or the cis-acetoxy compound gives the hydroxy ester in almost quantitative yield. And clearly that does, in the case of the cis ester, proceed through this open chain aldehyde intermediate. So we were this close to disaster, but no further. These other changes did not take place, or let's say could be avoided. <laughs> now, for the reasons that I've mentioned, the structure of the hydroxy ester was a matter of some importance. That is, containing as it does these uh, possibilities for very ready tautomeric and other structural changes, we had to be very sure that our structure was correct. Now, the organic chemist of the present day has, of course, a splendid armamentarium of physical measurements, uh, which are useful in deducing and confirming structures. And in the particular case at hand, that of our hydroxy ester intermediate, the infrared and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopic measurements were such as to give us considerable confidence that this structure was correct. But we felt that it was uh, worthwhile uh, in the circumstances uh, of making absolutely certain. And consequently, the structure of this substance was proven in an absolute and entirely unambiguous sense through a complete three-dimensional X-ray crystallographic determination of the structure of the corresponding hydroxy acid. Now that hydroxy acid, I'll mention very briefly, was prepared by a series of reactions very similar to the one that I've outlined here, except that instead of the methyl ester grouping, which appears in the intermediates that I've described, we used a trichloroethyl grouping, trichloroethyl, instead of methyl, and we were able to remove this trichloroethyl grouping, there'll be more to be said about that later, to give the corresponding hydroxy acid. That hydroxy acid, of course, could be correlated with the hydroxy ester through simple esterification of the hydroxy acid with diazomethane. And then Dr. Jack Gugatas in Cambridge carried out this single crystal uh, X-ray uh, diffraction study and was able to show beyond question in all details that we did in fact have precisely the structure that we hoped, namely the thiazolidine ring containing acid or ester grouping trans to the hydroxyl grouping. Now with this hydroxy compound we were in a position now to attempt a substitution reaction with inversion. Remember, back here, I pointed out that we had effected a substitution, but with the substituted grouping on the wrong side of the ring. That is, we want nitrogen over in the back, hydrogen in the front at the relevant center. We hoped that we could bring about that change in the following way, namely, by substituting the hydrogen of the hydroxyl group by a methane sulfonyl grouping. That should labelize the adjacent carbon-oxygen bond. The addition of the methane sulfonyl grouping should make this 
uh, bond, this carbon-oxygen bond, very susceptible, relatively very susceptible to displacement by a good uh, anion. And the anion we had in mind was the azide ion, which we hoped would come in from the back of this molecule and displace the methane sulfonyl ester grouping which sits on the top. You see, if we had a displacement reaction then, then the entering group will be in back where we want it. Now, it might have been regarded as a bit risky because what are we doing here? We're effecting a bimolecular substitution reaction of a very well-known type, the so-called SN2 bimolecular substitution with inversion. But we were doing this at a case which had never been studied before, namely with an alpha sulfur atom. Would this affect the reaction adversely? There was the possibility that it would. Now, in fact, when the methane sulfonyl derivative prepared from the hydroxyester in the usual way with methane sulfonyl chloride and uh, a base, specifically with diisopropyl ethylamine. When this methane sulfonyl derivative was treated with azide ion, a new substance, an azido ester, was produced. And we hoped, of course, that that azidoester was now the cis azidoester, namely that the reaction took place with inversion, thereby placing a nitrogen atom back of the five-membered ring where desired. If, in fact, this had occurred, we should at this stage have completed the solution of our stereochemical problem in its entirety. Because we should now have, as needed, as specified at the outset, our two-carbon backbone with alpha nitrogen, carboxyl, beta sulfur, and beta nitrogen, two asymmetric centers then, oriented with these hydrogens cis to one another. And remember that all of our intermediates are automatically optically active, they're fully resolved because we started with an optically active starting material. So if our presumption were correct about the course of these reactions, in this azidoester, the stereochemical problem should now be completed and we should now have the elements necessary for the construction of our nuclear key portion of the cephalosporins and the penicillins all present. Now again in this case, the physical measurements, the simple ones, the nuclear magnetic resonance measurements, the infrared measurements suggested that our presumption that we had the cis ester, namely that the substitution reaction had taken place with inversion, uh, these measurements suggested that this was correct, but again, we wanted more full evidence in view of the crucial nature of the stereochemical point. And so, the azido ester was next transformed into the amino ester.
the amino ester we hoped of this structure. I'd like to show you, just uh, for a special reason, some of the other products that were produced. In the reduction of the azidoester, and I may say parenthetically, in the hydrolysis of the phosphine imine derived from the azidoester. The azidoester reacts with triphenyl, tributyl, trimethylphosphine to give phosphine imines of this structure. And when the direct reduction seemed to be giving difficulties, we felt that perhaps this indirect method of producing the phosphine imine with loss of nitrogen, followed by hydrolysis of the phosphine imine, might represent a better way of getting the uh, amino ester which was desired. However, both the direct reduction experiments and the hydrolytic cleavage of the phosphine imines gave, in addition always to some of the desired amino ester, the following substances. Some of the trans amino ester. Some of this open chain beta amino alpha beta unsaturated ester with a free sulfhydryl group and with the ring open. Some of the related compound which had lost the elements of thioacetone. And some of the thiazoline of this structure. Now, I'm sure you'll recognize that these substances are the nitrogen analogs of the hypothetical series of oxygen compounds, which I represented as possible stages in the suicide of the hydroxy ester. And so you see these uh, possibilities were by no means the products of our overheated imagination. That is, these things not only can, but do happen provided our intermediates are not treated with proper care. <coughs> well, in subsequent stages in our work, we did find that the azidoester could be reduced to the amino ester in almost quantitative yield using sodium stannite under strongly basic conditions. A uh, rather interesting point of detail uh, in that the azidoester is, is, is uh, extremely readily susceptible to elimination of the azido 
group under basic conditions to give the thiazoline ester which appears there on the left. That is, treated with base alone, even mild base, this azido group is eliminated and the unsaturated ester is obtained. But the stannite is so strong a reducing agent that even though one must use extremely strongly basic media, even to create stannite iron, that the reduction takes precedence over the elimination and a quantitative yield almost of the amino ester can be obtained. Now, again, I've indicated that the amino ester has the same configuration as the azido ester, and that we hoped the azido ester had been formed from the hydroxy ester through the methane sulfonyl derivative by an inversion reaction. Again, we wanted to be absolutely sure of that. Again, the nuclear magnetic resonance and infrared uh, spectra were more or less in accord with the view that we did have the cis ester, that these two hydrogen atoms were on the same side of the five-membered ring. But you will appreciate that, for example, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, generalizations for five-membered rings, particularly containing heteroatoms and heavily substitutive groups, are not particularly convincing. And consequently, Dr. Gugatas was kind enough to do a complete X-ray crystallographic uh, uh, structure determination on a single crystal of the amino ester and uh, using, I might say, incidentally, the sulfur atom as the heavy atom in order to solve the structure very easily. And again, we had then this completely unambiguous proof of the cis amino ester structure. We knew then that our amino group, our carboxyl group, were on the same side of the five-membered ring and that, in fact, we had in this intermediate all of the elements now of the key central part of our cephalosporin molecule and our stereochemical problem was solved. We had cis hydrogen atoms. Our intermediate is optically active and no stereochemical problem remains of any kind. Now, that is to say then, from the theoretical point of view, that this bimolecular substitution had in fact taken place chloroester using thionyl chloride in the presence of uh, diacylpropyl ethylamine. And in that case, the crystalline chloride was formed from the crystalline alcohol, in this case with retention, in 96% yield. Used to 98% yield. I think these are probably the smoothest bimolecular substitution reactions, the first with retention, and the second with inversion, which have ever been, in a practical way, observed. So surprisingly, the presence of the sulfur atom, far from causing trouble, has made these essentially into standard cases. And the kinds of things which go wrong with bimolecular substitutions, in general, do not. The sulfur helps rather than hinders. And that is probably a consequence of the rather high energy of this electronic configuration. That is, electron deficient carbon next to sulfur is a relatively high energy, represents a relatively high energy situation. Unlike the simple or what might appear to be the simple analogous case of electron deficient next carbon next to oxygen, where, of course, the oxygen stabilizes this electron deficiency very effectively. Well, there's excellent reason for supposing that that would not be the case with sulfur, and it seems to be this factor which permits us to carry out these substitution reactions at this carbon atom with an attached sulfur with such very smooth and clean results. 
All right, then at the stage of this amino ester, we had then all of the elements of uh, all of the elements we felt were needed for the construction of our nuclear portion of the cephalosporin molecule. You remember I said that one of the key points or elements of our plan was to prepare this central portion, this nuclear portion containing the four-membered lactam ring. Now we have everything present that, are, that should be needed for the construction of that lactam ring, in short, for the reduction to practice of this key element of our overall plan. And indeed, in the X-ray crystallographic study of the structure of the amino ester, it was rather encouraging that the distance between the nitrogen atom at this point and the carbon atom of this carbonyl group, namely this distance, was rather low for non-bonded atoms. It was 2.82 angstroms, which is rather closer than atoms are wont to be if they're not directly bonded. And so it almost looked as though this amino ester wanted to close to the beta-lactam. And it was therefore gratifying that when the amino ester was treated with trialkyl aluminum compounds, that the desired change took place and the beta-lactam ring was readily closed. And so if you'll permit me to move over here. The amino ester, first with triisobutyl aluminum and subsequently with triethyl aluminum in the presence of weak bases, such as toluidine. The amino ester lost the elements of methanol and gave this beta-lactam. The elements of methanol being lost from these cis-disposed groups. Under the influence of trialkyl aluminums, and specifically of trialkyl aluminum compounds. Now the mechanism of that reaction is very interesting in itself. It's a long story which I'm not going to tell this afternoon. We can't even say that we know the mechanism, uh, though we can make a number of suggestions which are not lacking in interest. In a practical sense, the reaction can be carried out quite easily and does give this beta-lactam product in which now we have taken our cysteine and converted it into the central nuclear portion common to the penicillins and the cephalosporins. In other words, we have this unique and unusual structural element almost naked. That is, here is the beta-lactam ring with its alpha nitrogen and its beta sulfur, all of the important features common to the penicillins and the cephalosporins, just with some protecting groups attached. Now, if we had had some reason, let's say, to be a little concerned about the structure of our hydroxyester and of our amino ester, we should perhaps have had even more serious doubts about the beta-lactam, since it contains within itself all of the structural features which might lead to destruction along the lines which I've outlined for the hydroxyester, which I've demonstrated for the amino ester. And in addition, of course, has the highly strained and reactive 
fatal actam system. So in a sense, this was perhaps the most dangerous of all of our compounds. And we felt, again, that we needed to know its structure for certain. And so again, we were obliging enough to give Dr. Gugatas a single crystal of the lactam, and he was obliging enough to carry out a complete three-dimensional X-ray crystallographic analysis of the structure, which proved beyond question that we did, in fact, have precisely this bicyclic cis-locked beta-lactam of the structure which I've shown. Again, using, of course, the sulfur atom as the heavy atom in order to uh, unravel the structure. Now, let us for a moment advert to the basic plan, the major portion of which has now been completed. We have the beta-lactam, which represents the common element of these naturally occurring structures with the properly placed alpha nitrogen, beta sulfur, with the stereochemical problem entirely solved, the intermediate that we have here is optically active, since we started with optically active cysteine. The relative and absolute configurations of the two centers are therefore the desired ones. And now I can show explicitly what our hope had been in choosing this method of approach. Namely, in this beta-lactam, we have one active hydrogen atom here, representing then a possible site for the attachment of new groupings. And if we could attach, using the active hydrogen of this NH, we could attach groupings of atoms here they might well be so constituted as to permit then a further linkage of the chain first attached to nitrogen, a further linkage to sulfur with the building up of a new ring. Now, in the most general terms, of course, that is just what we have to do in order to go from this key intermediate, this beta-lactam, to either cephalosporin, you see, which has the beta-lactam, the nitrogen, the sulfur, and here a chain of three carbon atoms with some attached atoms. Or to penicillin, which again has the beta-lactam, the nitrogen, the sulfur, and a chain of two carbon atoms with some attached atoms. So at least in principle, starting from this lactam, we might be able to attach first a chain at the nitrogen, and then link that round to sulfur to build on new rings which might then lead us to cephalosporins, to penicillins, or to who knows what new class of compounds depending on what things we might attach to the nitrogen. Well, our first objective was to make some members of the cephalosporin class. Now, I've said uh, quite casually that all we have to do now is attach a chain of atoms to this nitrogen taking advantage of the presence of the NH group. But of course, this is a fairly reactive substance. I've emphasized again and again uh, uh, that these compounds essentially are standing near the edge of a precipice over which they may fall at any moment. And so we felt, at least at first, that we must choose the component for combination with this beta-lactam very carefully. And the component that we chose was made as follows. <clears throat> First, we prepared the trichloroethyl ester of glyoxylic acid. And this was easily made from tartaric acid by conversion first to the bis trichloroethyl ester and then cleavage in the center by pariodate. Uh, that gave, of course, the aldehyde group. And so we had then this trichloroethyl glyoxylate 
which was easily isolated as the crystalline hydrate. And that substance then condensed very readily with malondialdehyde. Now malondialdehyde is a substance which is also very easy to obtain by the hydrolysis of the commercially available tetramethoxypropane, 1133 tetramethoxypropane. And you see it possesses a nucleophilic site in the beta position for condensation with this reactive aldehyde grouping. That produces then an aldol product of this structure. The new bond, of course, being produced here between these two components. Now, we felt that it might be possible to coax this aldol product into losing water. You notice that it is possible to write this kind of process for the elimination of a molecule or the elements of a molecule of water. And the product of such a loss of water should be interesting compound of a hitherto unknown type, namely a dialdehyde alkoxycarbonyl ethylene. In other words, a very highly electronegatively substituted ethylenic substance. It should be, one might expect, strongly electrophilic with these groupings attached to it. Now, we also thought that this component, this aldehyde, if it could be prepared, might react with an NH grouping. in a kind of concerted way. In other words, that as this hydrogen were adding to this oxygen, the nitrogen could be adding to the carbon. You can draw arrows around this if you want. The main point being that we felt that, quite conceivably, a highly electrophilic aldehyde of this constitution could react with an active NH center without the necessity for catalysis might get a spontaneous reaction of this sort. And we were rather hesitant to use catalysts with our NH compound, namely our beta-lactam, because we felt that catalysts for the condensation might mobilize its capacity for self-destruction. Well, in any event, when this aldol, which could be isolated in the crystalline form, was heated uh, at temperatures somewhat uh, above 100 degrees, it did lose water to give this dialdehyde, which is a very highly reactive substance. It was not possible to isolate and keep it in a pure state. But when it was put in the presence of the beta-lactam, part of which you see here, just as this NH group, combination in just this desired sense did in fact occur. And the following adduct was obtained. 
you see, the new bond was produced between nitrogen and the aldehyde component, the bond which I've symbolized here as hopeful. That was produced, and this adduct was formed. Now, in fact, there is a detail here of some interest. A new center of asymmetry is created when that carbon-nitrogen bond formation occurs. And really, two adducts are produced. differing in stereochemistry at this center, at the newly created asymmetric center. I think you can see that that is a center which in our objective, namely cephalosporin C, is no longer asymmetric. So in fact, this departure from stereospecificity is rectified as we shall see shortly. The adducts can be, but need not be, separated. The two different stereoisomeric adducts which are produced can be, but need not be, from the point of view of practice, separated at this point. Well, in this reaction, then, of this rather unusual trisubstituted olefin with the beta-lactam, you see we have introduced a chain of three carbon atoms. And following the principle outlined here, one might imagine then the possibility of closing the chain now to the sulfur in order to create a six-membered ring. And of course, it is just that, namely a six-membered ring, which we need in order to make the cephalosporins. Well, in order to attempt to bring that reaction about, or that change about, the adduct, or I can say the adducts, the mixture of adducts, or either pure one, was treated with trifluoroacetic acid for a short while at room temperature. And the product of that reaction had the following structure. It was, in fact, a cyclic aldehyde, the new bond between carbon and sulfur which was needed, was made. The precise mechanism of the reaction is one for which a number of possibilities might be suggested. They're all essentially the same, the elements being as follows, namely the dialdehyde system would be expected to be protonatable. That would increase the already electrophilic character of this carbon. And of course, then the proximity of that carbon in space to the sulfur permits an attack by sulfur to uh, diminish the electron deficiency at the carbon. That, of course, constitutes the formation of a new sulfur-carbon bond. It would leave the sulfur positive now, that is a situation in which electrons could be taken from this bond in order to alleviate that electron deficiency. And then, ultimately, it would be possible to take electrons from way over here, leaving a proton isobutylene carbon dioxide. And the amino group in the protected form of N acetonilidine. That is, this isopropylidine group would appear as this kind of isopropylidine group if the sequence of changes were that which I have indicated 
uh, on the central formula. And we know that uh, such substances are readily cleaved in trifluoroacetic acid. So that would give us the amino group over here. And of course, the final change over here would be the loss of water to constitute this beta alkyl mercapto alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl system. Well, all of these changes do in fact take place under these very simple experimental conditions, namely when the adduct is treated with trifluoroacetic acid. And it's a rather uh, uh, pleasing feature of the reaction that uh, while we make the carbon sulfur bond, which we need in order to complete this six-membered ring, at the same time, we lose all these protecting groups, which of course have served their function uh, in the earlier stages of the work and are no longer needed. They very obligingly fold their tents and steal away in the course of this very simple reaction. Now, with the amino aldehyde, and in fact there are, I should say, two of them, of course, because, again, there is a symmetry at this point, and the two aldehydes have been separated and characterized separately, but need not be, for reasons which we shall see shortly. Now, in this intermediate, then, we have the beta-lactam ring, the crucial key part of the structure of both the penicillins and the cephalosporins. We have now the six-membered ring of the cephalosporins, and that six-membered ring happens to bear a protected carboxyl group at this position, and even a branch here, which might be useful for the particular grouping of atoms present at the corresponding position in cephalosporin C or in cephalotin. And there is here a free amino group at which substituents might be added. And so having the amino aldehydes in hand, our first step was to protect or to add to that amino group a thiophene acetic acid grouping, and that gave us then in other words, the free amine was acylated with thiophene alpha acetyl chloride in the presence of pyridine to give this amid. And that gave us then this substance. And again, the two aldehydes differing in configuration at this point were isolated in the crystalline state and characterized separately. So again, it's not necessary to do that. Now, if you examine the structure of cephalotene, which is uh, or consider the structure of cephalotene, which we have uh, looked at uh, quite some time ago now, you realize that what we must do, among other things, is transform this grouping uh, by reduction into a acetoxy methyl grouping. And that was effected very simply by reduction with diborane to the corresponding alcohol, just adding two hydrogens to the aldehyde group. And the resulting alcohol was then acetylated in the normal way with acetic anhydride and pyridine to give the acetoxy compound. <laughs> 
Now, this acetoxy compound, obtained as described, is getting quite similar to cephalotine over here. You see, cephalotine has an alpha, an acetoxy methyl grouping attached to the six-membered ring. The major difference is that in this substance, which we've gotten to by synthesis, we have a double bond, beta gamma, to an ester grouping, unconjugated with the ester grouping. Whereas in cephalotin, the double bond is conjugated with the ester grouping, namely in the alpha beta position. Well, I'm sure this is a situation which many of you recognize uh, is one in which the two isomers of this sort, the conjugated and the unconjugated isomer, can be equilibrated in the presence of a suitable proton-removing catalyst. The proton would be the one here. If that be removed, and added back here, then the conjugated ester would be obtained. In other words, one might anticipate that this beta gamma ester would be equilibrated with the corresponding conjugated alpha beta unsaturated ester in the presence of bases. And indeed, In the presence of pyridine, these two substances do go into a very cleanly established equilibrium, starting with either one of them. One gets an equilibrium mixture of the unconjugated and the conjugated isomers. In this case, where we have the thiophene acetyl group attached to nitrogen, the equilibrium relationships are such that there is uh, about uh, two and a half to one, I'm sorry, two and a half of the unconjugated ester to one of the conjugated ester. That is, the unconjugated ester predominates slightly at equilibrium, but the two isomeric esters are very readily separable by chromatography on silica gel, so one can very easily effect the conversion uh, to the conjugated isomer in a practical way. Now, a word about the situation with respect to isomerism at this center. As I mentioned, these aldehydes, isomeric at this center, have been isolated, each of them in the crystalline state, and well characterized. When the reduction acetylation sequence is carried out, only a single compound is obtained from either aldehyde. That is to say, either stereoisomeric aldehyde of this structure gives the same beta gamma unsaturated ester, which in fact has the hydrogen down as shown here. We have been able to prove this by fairly elaborate nuclear magnetic resonance studies. So here is the point you see at which the first stage in the uh, problem presented by new stereoisomerism here is dealt with. That is, whichever isomer we have here, we get at this stage already the same isomer by the time we reach this point. And, of course, in the equilibration to give the final product, there's no asymmetry at all at this center, so that quite clearly the aldehyde uh, back at this stage, the adduct, although either of these substances is a mixture of isomers as produced, it's not necessary to separate those isomers, but simply to go through to this stage, and already uh, the mixture of isomers is converted to the same, converges to the same intermediate. So this generation of new and unwanted asymmetry at an intermediary stage poses no practical problem from the synthetic point of view.
intermediate reached in this way now contains the alpha beta unsaturated ester center within the required six membered ring. It has the acetoxymethyl group of the cephalosporins in the desired position. It has the specific side chain characteristic of cephalotine. And it does, in fact, differ from that substance, cephalotine, now in only one respect. Namely, in place of the free carboxyl group of cephalotine, this has an esterified grouping, an esterified carboxyl group, esterified, namely, with the trichloroethyl group. Now, from the very outset of our work, it had been quite clear that we should need to protect the carboxyl group of our objective in some special way. I've already indicated that the beta-lactam ring of these substances is very readily cleaved. And consequently, it seemed undesirable to use a protective grouping for the carboxyl function which must be freed at the end by a hydrolytic process. Now, what we had had in mind in using the trichloroethyl grouping was the following, namely, Here I've indicated a beta, beta, beta trichloroethoxycarbonyl compound in the general sense. And what we had hoped was that such a group could be cleaved reductively by, for example, a beta elimination reaction involving, let us say, zinc, which might attack a chlorine leading to this series of electronic migrations, giving as products dichloroethylene and the liberated anion of the desired acid. We felt that the beta-beta trichloro, beta-beta-beta trichloroethanol as a sterifying alcohol had several advantages. First, it's a very readily available alcohol it forms esters readily. Secondly, statistically, having three chlorines, one favored very much having the groups participating, the bonds participating in the elimination reaction, necessarily aligned all the time in the desired favorable anti-planar conformation. That is, at least one of the chlorines is going to be in this anti-planar relationship to the oxygen at all times. And finally, the presence of three chlorines should have the interesting effect that the two which are not suffering attack should favor electron accession to the carbon backbone where a double bond is being formed. So we hope that reductive removal of such a group might be quite easy, and in the event it turned out, in fact, to be. When, for example, this ester, this ester obtained by synthesis, was reduced with zinc and aqueous acetic acid for a short time at room temperature. The trichloroethyl grouping was removed, and the free acid was produced. 
free acid of this structure. And this structure is, of course, that of cephalotin. And the acid produced in this reductive reaction was identical in every respect with cephalotin itself prepared from natural, natural cephalosporin C through replacement of the alpha amino adipoyl group of cephalosporin C artificially by the thiophene alpha acetyl group. So with this, at this point, we had completed the synthesis of the first of the cephalosporins, this derived partially synthetic, uh, hitherto partially synthetic cephalotin was now prepared by total synthesis along the path that I have indicated. Now, for uh, the next stage, we wanted uh, more or less for formal purposes to complete the synthesis of the, the original criminal cephalosporin C itself. And of course, with our intermediate here, with this aldehyde, we had a very versatile substance because with its free amino group, we could attach at this point anything that we wanted, presumably. And so our next step was to take this same aldehyde, which we had converted to cephalotin uh, along the route, which I've indicated at the top there, and to condense it with a different com acylating component. <clears throat> that aldehyde now, in a new series of reactions, was Condensed with this substance, this is the trichloroethyl oxycarbonyl derivative of D minus alpha amino adipic acid. And you'll see that represents the side chain of natural cephalosporin C. The condensation of the amino aldehyde with this diacid was initiated by dicyclohexyl carbodiimide, which of course activates the carboxyl group. Now, this is a fairly rough and crude experiment. You will observe that in this component there are two carboxyl groups, and we didn't really uh, care too much about that. We expected that the carboxyls would be separately activated, that the reaction at this more remote one would be favored, since this one is rather hindered by this fairly bulky trichloroethyl oxycarbonyl amino group. But we anticipated that in fact two acylated aldehydes would be obtained, and two were obtained. One of them the major product this and of course the other was the one in which this carboxyl was attached to the nitrogen rather than the one that I've shown now the mixture of products was not separated but rather in a second stage the free carboxyl groups were further esterified with trichloroethanol <coughs> 
using in this case trichloroethanol itself, again dicyclohexyl carbodiimide, and in this case pyridine as a catalyst. Now this gave two substances, again a mixture, one the substance that I've shown here, and the other the corresponding substance in which this carbonyl and this carbonyl are reversed in function. Those two completely protected derivatives were very readily separable by chromatography. And one of them, the major product, was now subjected to reduction with diborane in tetrahydrofurane in order to add two hydrogen atoms to the aldehyde grouping. And the resulting alcohol was, again, acetylated in the usual way with acetic anhydride and pyridine. And again, of course, just as in the earlier series, we now had a beta-gamma unsaturated ester, which, with pyridine, was very smoothly equilibrated. with the corresponding alpha-beta unsaturated conjugated isomer. This substance was, again, very easily separable chromatographically from its beta-gamma unconjugated isomer. And now you will notice that the conjugated isomer is, in fact, a substance in which three reactive groupings are protected by this trichloroethyl grouping. Here we have a carboxyl, which is protected by a trichloroethanol ester function. Here a second carboxyl, similarly protected by a trichloroethyl function. And here, just a little different, we have an amino group protected by a trichloroethyl oxycarbonyl function. This substance, then, was subjected to the action of zinc and aqueous acetic acid, in this case at zero degrees for a bit more than an hour, in the hope that we would free this carboxyl group, this carboxyl group, and that, of course, a carboxyl group would be freed here, and in its character as a carbamic acid would lose carbon dioxide to give the free amino group. Well, now, if you examine all of those changes, the product of such a zinc reduction, were it to take that course, would, in fact, be cephalosporin C itself. And indeed it was. The protected ester obtained by synthesis on reduction with zinc gave cephalosporin C identical 
in all respects with the natural substance, and in this case, the identity was established through the spectroscopic measurements, uh, especially on the crystalline barium salt, and furthermore, through the observation, uh, quantitative observations of the antibiotic activity against a fairly wide range of uh, susceptible microorganisms. So that in this way, we were able to complete the total synthesis, uh, first of a derived member of the cephalosporin group, cephalotine, and then ultimately uh, the synthesis of the natural uh, mother substance of the entire class of cephalosporins, namely cephalosporin C itself. And in this way, we're able then to reduce to practice our general plan for the synthesis of substances of this unusual class. Now, I think I'll take just a bit more time to point out that this is not a finished story. You see, the basis of our whole plan was the construction first of this intermediate, which contained this unique beta-lactam system, which is the common structural element in the cephalosporins and the penicillins. And I indicated here that we might be able to fuse onto here a three-carbon suitably substituted chain to get the cephalosporins. And I've indicated how, in fact, we did that. But I did indicate that more generally, at least in principle, we might be able to attach other groupings to create, for example, the penicillins, or depending on our choice of attached atoms, entirely new groupings of substances. Have we been able to make any progress in that direction? The answer is that there is uh, a certain uh, basis for optimism that we might be able to. And I'll just conclude by indicating the direction in which we have moved in an attempt to exploit this feature or this potentiality of our basic plan. The beta-lactam in the experiments that I described was combined with this rather unique olefin containing three highly electron-attracting groups. The beta-lactam also combines with other substances, among which is the glyoxylic ester, which was itself an intermediate in the preparation of our dialdehyde olefin. That is to say, the beta-lactam condenses very smoothly with trichloroethyl glyoxylate, to give this substance perfectly stable crystalline substance. Notice that although it is an acyl carbonolamine, which might just fall apart into the components, it does not in fact do so. Perfectly stable, manipulable compound, which is smoothly transformed by the action of thionyl chloride in the presence of diisopropylethylamine into the corresponding chloroester. of the structure. The chloroester in its turn 
reacts with triphenylphosphine. To give a quaternary salt, which very readily loses a proton, to give the stable, isolable, nicely crystalline triphenylphosphorane of this structure. Notice this unending series of absolutely remarkable substances. There are phosphorane attached to this beta lactam, a carbonolamine. All of them exist. It's worth perhaps sometimes trying to make compounds which would be regarded by the examiner of any elementary student as ridiculous suggestions. The triphenylphosphorane shares with the less bizarrely constructed members of its class the capacity for reacting, for example, with aldehydes. in this fashion. Now, for example, the aldehydes which have been condensed, uh, giving, of course, as the other product, triphenylphosphine oxide, are formaldehyde, which gives a quantitative yield of the compound with R equals H, uh, butyraldehyde, which gives a mixture, which is separable, of the stereoisomers in which the propyl group R is here or here. The original trichloroethyl glyoxylate, of course, condenses to give a diester here. And so this represents, we think, uh, perhaps a versatile intermediate for adding new kinds of chain to this nitrogen and sets the stage, we rather hope, for building new kinds of rings onto this sulfur atom. Now, one possibility from here is that protonation of the carbonyl group of this ester group would make this an electron deficient system which might form a new bond to sulfur in a way rather analogous to the manner in which we have already formed a new bond to sulfur in the earlier work leading to the cephalosporins. If one draws out that particular possibility, you will see that a five-membered ring is constructed, and in fact, the penicillins would be produced. Have we yet been able to bring about this reaction? I don't know, but I'm going to Basel Thursday, and I may find out. <laughs> and that gives me the opportunity to make the very important concluding statement that the success of all of this work depends upon the the very great experimental skill, the extreme enthusiasm and devotion of my colleagues at the Woodward Research Institute in Basel, who carried out all of this work. And indeed, here this afternoon, I'm simply acting as a spokesman for this, spokesman for this uh, magnificent group of men. And if you have enjoyed what I've told you uh, here, it is to them that you owe your thanks. And to you, uh, I owe thanks for the extraordinary patience which you've shown in listening to this uh, already very much too long account. Thank you very much.